Well, Bob, what was that first song that we played? And it was a crazy beat. I never heard that song of yours before. Oh snap! You never heard that one? Damn, I man. never heard that. Which I don't. I don't know. I didn't hear it either. I was that, coming that, home from work. That was called favorite song from uh, the the Deadly Nedley. You know where I've been? Uh, same place that I've oh, been. Oh, after we were seeing back in again, I like found your friend. You know what? Yeah, yeah, you, you were done with it at that point. My team on cookie. Yeah. Be smoking I just ran. I'm coming I'm back, right back to say the piece. Yeah, I know that's the deal. I'm getting big. I'm getting cheap. They know it's You said some shit on that one, man. Yeah, ground covered on that one. This is war zone. I'd say that's one of my favorites. Welcome aboard, everybody in chat. This is Rappers Fly Information. My name is Dubious. I've been talking to artists across the country. I'm learning more about them and their motivation, their new projects, their scenes. Here we are, two representatives, long time from the Edmonton rap scene. We got the brothers Grim, Matt Grim, Comrade. What's up, guys? I just grin. I'm coming back and saying the future's grim. Yo, that's the damn. I never tell them what I've been doing. They've been saying no more influence. All I know is how to get to the house. But now, because I've been doing it, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, um, dude, you guys just put out, I feel like it was a bit of a hiatus before Book of Grim, right? Like, you had kind of stepped back off the scene. What was the release? Before no truth to them, I'm through with them, and I will never let them go. 25 years, 2018. Oh, okay. Yeah, so yeah, a bit of a bit of a breather there. Um, oh, here, let me cut off the music. We've been running that in the background. There we go. Okay, now people should be able to hear us. <laughs> yeah, good call, Goose. Thank you. Um, so yeah the the new album though book of grim it's entirely produced by Kripal. Uh I wanted to ask you guys like were you kind of running around looking for somebody with a bunch of beats to make a new album to, or did Kripal spur you all back into action or how, how did it come together? Kripal dragged us back in. <laughs> <laughs> Just when you thought we were out, they pulled us back in, right. but no, um, I guess I'll, I'll speak on kind of my half first and then calm. You can kind of take over. Cause, uh, from Beverly boys to book of Grimm, Comrade like continued doing his thing. He 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 did like a bunch of singles work and he had an EP in the bank, good to go. Um and yeah, it was around four or five years where I was really done with music, man. And uh why? It was like a cross between like I love music, I hate the music business. Mm -hmm. I hate and I and I'd gone through the ringer of the battle act shit. And then after the fact, I had had some other bad experiences with some people who were trying to invest into my music after that. And I was really done with music, along with the culture clash of the type of people I was bringing into the culture of hip hop. Yeah. Yeah. And what my music was, and I was not a fan of it. It was like inviting, having a house party and like nine out of 10 of the people you brought have muddy work boots on and they're just stomping around and you're like, yo, like take your shoes off, man, you know, treat this with some respect. Yeah. But like, so one of the things I would hate is I'd, we'd go to, we'd tour all over the country, but you'd go to these smaller towns and people would be like, I hate rap music, but I love the brothers Grimm. And it was just like, ugh, the, the yeah. twang on the sentence. It was just so rough. It's the last thing like, you want to hear. Yeah. Yeah. And I, cause I love this shit. And so like, yeah, there was, it was combined with a lot of different things like that. And I was just really like done with music. Um, and then the world kind of stopped. Um, and when I was done with music, I was really like gung ho. Like I was in a nine year relationship and I was just like, yeah, I just want to be a family man. Da, da, da. That didn't work out. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so then I was still like, no, I don't want to do music. Kripal is touring, killing it. And like, he, he took off. His brand is insane. Like he's out in Australia right now. So like, yeah, it's, it's crazy to see him take off. And he had even asked Calm, like, "Hey man, do my uh, tour show? His sounds made up tour." I had turned that down. Calm's like, "Hey, I'm gonna do this," and he rocked it. And then later on that year, uh, there was another show opportunity that had came up. It was uh, Tech Nine in Edmonton here, and Kripal was doing that tour too. And he's just like, "Come on, man, do three songs." And so I did the three songs. And then after, like during that show, he's like, I'm going to finish these, uh, these show dates with tech nine. And then when I come back, just come over, 
let's just let's just have some theory, some game planning. And yeah, he uh, it's all praise to him. Yeah. On my end at least. So during that time I know Calm was still working, so I'll pass it off to him. Yeah, like Beverly Boys came out, it did very well. It was definitely our best kind of received project. It was our first project post Battle Axe and we did two tours post Battle Axe where we didn't we weren't waving the banner, we were still going across the country doing the shit. And then it was when we yeah, I don't know. I don't know at least what the shift was for me. I guess the biggest difference for me is I had a kid, right? And so I didn't tell. It was funny. It was on the last tour. I didn't tell anybody. Pat knew, but I didn't tell any of my tour mates or anything. And then we were literally like coming up 50th Street on Yellowhead after a month and a half tour. And I turned to the van and I'm like, oh, by the way, guys, if I've seen a bit on edge this tour, or I've seen a bit difference because I'm having a son here in like six months. And so, right, I had my kid. And then after that, at least for me, I mean, if I'm going to be all the way transparent, I had my kid and then two weeks later, they also legalized. And so the immense um, capital that I once had to invest in music dried up overnight, if that makes any sense. (laughs) Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Yeah, I get what you're putting on. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it went from being able to blow five to 10K a month on music to zero dollars for music. And I now have a kid. So for me, it was like, I don't really have the same drive to do it as a career, right? I have a career. I have a very good job. It's the job that has allowed me to do music for the last 10 years and tour and all of that stuff. So it's like, I didn't have the drive to be like, okay. And I still, and I'll be honest, I still don't like, I got no fucking desire to tour again. The only time I'd ever tour again is if I'm flying, I'm never driving across Canada in a van again. I've done it enough. (laughs) I fucking hated every minute of it. Like there's nothing about driving for eight hours. That's fun. Yeah. man. You know, for one of the tours. Yeah, it was bullshit. It was just bullshit. I was over it. I was like, you know, I, I I never said I'm done with music. I still wanted to do music. But then I was like, I'm going to do this now as a hobby, basically, as something I love part time. I'm going to do it when I have the money, when I can do it, you know. And so, yeah, I was still releasing singles here and there. I was still doing features. Um, I did a whole EP with uh, Joey uh, Violin that that's actually going to come out later this year, finally. But I had, I had all these little projects on the go and everything. And then, yeah, Kripal came around. He's like, let's do this show. Dude, I I recognize Joey Violin's name. He's a producer. Where's, where's he from? Uh, He's out of Saskatoon. Saskatoon, yeah. Okay. I want to say Saskatoon. And Pat had worked with him previously. Like we have done a lot of work with Joey. Joey is a very, very underground producer. Yeah. Yeah. He produced my whole project, Do What You Want, that I, it was just a YouTube release a few oh, years yeah. back. And that was a solo dope. project? Yep. So, so. Yeah, that, that, that was, um, and, and then we, so we did, like, Kripal comes around with this show, come do the show. I, you know, I effectively begged Pat to get on it. Pat's like, no, I'm good. Like, I'm fucking good. Rap's whack. The, the game's whack. And I was like, <laughs> I hear you. My heart's but, broken. Yeah, just the game is it. whack. I hear you. Okay, whatever. So then the Tech Nine show came around, and then that it's like, yo, we had rocked Tech Nine half a dozen times before. It's always our crowd, great show. So we did that, and then yeah, the rest is history. We just started going to Kripal, I think, every week or every second week, and we would just session. It would just be like, all right, let's make a beat. All right, let's write to it. All right, let's make a beat. We ended up doing, I want to say, like. 20 songs, 20 or 21 songs. Yeah, 20 total. It ended up going down to 13 for the album. Nice. So it's like, yeah, I don't know. My heart will always be in music. I'll still always do music. But that idea of like Pat touched on earlier, like the music industry is so disgusting. And we're seeing it now on, uh, you know, where you, I mean, Diddy and the whole rap game, like it's being exposed, but like that Diddy level shit happens in Canada too. You know what I mean? It does. Like the game in Canada is just as dirty. It's just as connected. So if it's not connected to perverts, it's connected to criminals. If it's not connected to criminals, it's connected to fucking liars. If it's not connected to liars, it's connected to fucking thieves. Yeah. And so it's like, our morals and how we moved also always kept us out of a lot of rooms because you know people would spill their secrets to us of all these fucking rappers they hate and they're beefing with and then they'd see oh shit brothers grim isn't using that 
they're not immediately going around and using that for promotion for their own gain. And so I felt like it was a lot of like, because we moved with integrity, doors were getting closed. It right. was like, ah, oh, all right, you're not slimy like us. All right, sorry, you can't come into the party. Ah, oh, you don't want carrots in your ass. Sorry, you can't come to the party. Con you guys men aren't can on tell when shit. people are seeing through their bullshit, right? So yeah, exactly. they'd be closing the doors. You know, on them. And, yeah. and I and I also like I've never held my tongue. So it's like, you know, I from the get go, it's like I gave um what the fuck's that bitch's name Chelsea a fucking tent. We did a show with her. I want to say almost a decade ago. And I set up this big show for her, da, da, da. And bit, long story short, she kind of welched on her deal. I figured out it was this, this giant pay to play bullshit, da, da, da. And so I would preach to the heavens for years, like fuck these certain people. But because I would loudly say fuck these certain people, but these certain people still had pull in the music industry. Right. Everybody's out is like, Whoa, I don't know if we can fuck with Brothers Grimm. They're out here calling out people who put money in our pockets. Even if they put it in in a slimy way, hey, they're putting money in our pockets. So, yo, Brothers Grimm, why are you, being a, why are you fucking with my money, Brothers Grimm? Uh, <laughs> and so it was like, I don't know. And that's where I'm at with the music. And even with this latest album, it's like I wasn't going around and trying to be like, Hey, famous friends, can you fucking post this for me? Hey, give me a share, please. Da da da. Like, it's just like, no, fuck you. If you like my music, it's here. If you fuck with us, it's here. If you support us, it's here. If not, hit the fucking road, man. Yeah. I'm too old for this shit. And that's how you can tell that artists are actually doing it like authentically because they want to be doing it when they're putting out art that they're not necessarily like promoting in all directions as hard as they can. You know, some guys, when I see the promotional push, I'm just like, is this guy just trying to do this for the money? Like, does he really think that this is just the best way to make money? Cause I, I don't get that mentality. It's tough to make money in, in music. Right. Like, um, and it's also why to be fair, we've seen so many of our peers quit music to just become YouTubers Yeah, because it wasn't ever about rap for them. They didn't give a fuck about rap. They wanted to be famous and they found a quicker, easier way to be famous. And they did that. Yeah. And honestly, I respect those guys more. <laughs> because at least they were honest with themselves and they got the fuck out of music. Word. And if you're killing it as a YouTuber, good for you, buddy. But at least you're not trying to pimp the art form anymore. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. Can we talk about how, how long did it take to put this new Book of Grimm together? Like uh, you guys mentioned just session after session at Kripal's house, but did it come together pretty quick? Yeah, like I mean, two, two, three months, pretty three much months. as far as... The writing yeah. process was three months. And yeah, the recording the, the promotion process. of it and the shooting the videos and getting the money to pay for the mixing and the mastering that took longer than the making yeah. of it. Yeah, right. that took about nine months to get some money together to get acquire right. sponsors from our fan base and shit. So but yeah, three months. I have a line in in that uh, in in the new project where I was like, "It took you years to write a project, me a couple months." Yeah, and it's like, yeah, it, it, the, the music shit comes easy, and and with I'll be honest, Kripal's beats, his production brought out oh. the fucking meanest in us so it was easy it wasn't like we're sitting there with fucking c grade beats like these are all a plus beats he was handing us so yeah and came because the we have day one chemistry with kripal too it wasn't just like yeah. here is here's a great producer that you don't know like when you actually got like, to sit with him too right it wasn't just a beat pack you're working with yeah yeah, yeah you know like and and because he's our homie for for a long ass time it'd be like make a beat watch some wrestling, make a beat, smoke a joint, you know, watch, watch some YouTube. So you guys were actually battle. in the spot while he was making the beats? Like, were you able to sit oh, yeah. and, and write as the beats were coming together and stuff? Yeah. Nice. yeah. Nice. Con conceptualize hooks or stuff. And like our ape asses would be telling Kripal, like, cause I'm music dumb. So I'd be like, no, bro, I want the, t -t 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 -t. I don't know what that is, but it needs to be <laughs> like this. Or I need the, but the, the, the. like, that's how I try to describe to producers. Cause I don't, I, I don't, I still can't, use the right words for what's the hat what's the snare what's the kick i'm just like yo this part that sound we need to change that sound <laughs> nice so he was able to customize things as you guys needed it then too yeah well, that, that goes a long way it was good too because he knows us both so well and we have such a good relationship and like there was calm would write a hook i would write a hook 
me we're brothers so we're always gonna think that our shit is better than the other brothers it's just what it is so you guys are actual a, brothers right I, i've never known that yeah. but yeah okay actual born <laughs> in the same family brothers okay out of the yeah. same vagina man yeah hey there it is damn <laughs> you guys always keep it raw um can i ask <laughs> where, where'd you where'd you record for the uh, new one? up in arms recordings so, yeah, did you guys get to use Taylor. that super yeah. mic that he just got the fucking no. c800 or whatever it is we missed out on it so i gotta do another yeah. project but i'm gonna do gelato in the rain on that mic for sure nice nice Bro, that's and, the name of the next that's... one yeah. That's, that's my that's next, next that's project. the solo one and and to be fair a lot of this book of grim does have gelato in the rain songs so pat came with some concepts brought them in words and then it was like yo okay calm we'll put a verse here da 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 we'll put this here da 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 so that's where i say on this project i was challenged the most because i don't normally i ain't trying to do different flows i'm not trying to do double times i'm not trying to sing but this project kind of forced me to a little bit you know go out of my comfort zone for real so this wasn't the first time you guys had worked with nato right oh no oh. we've been with him Bro. since he was at his house yeah right. i was gonna say i've been recording yeah. with nato i i i take credit to having some of the last nato produced beats because NATO also used to produce many, many moons ago. Yeah. And there's NATO beats on my shit. I got touch on one of my NATO beats uh, for uh, book, uh, not book of Grimm for Beverly, Beverly boys. boys. He's on, yeah. He's on United. And so like, beautiful there. Yeah. I don't know. NATO's always like literally since he was recording out of his house, bro, we've been there with him, and then into the Chinatown studio and now over to the fucking North side. What's NATO like as an engineer? I've never actually asked anybody. I've talked to people who have worked with him, but like, oh. what's, what's working with NATO like? What's a session end he's up as? He's the best. Yeah. Like, yeah. he's very, so like, I didn't have a relationship with NATO until like working with him with music. And I know Calm had like kind of been friends with them and known him. So like, it was, uh, it's, he's able to tell me, I guess, like, when to do shit properly, you know, that wasn't a good take. Like, yeah. um, that goes a long and, ways, man. A little bit of trust between an engineer and the people they're recording to, to even just offer like, Hey, you could do it with a different tone of voice or emphasize this just mm -hmm. one little bit different. Right. And actually have the artist hear it. That goes a long ways, man. Yeah. yeah. NATO's the man. Dope. He's uh, he's a funny guy. I don't think of people give NATO enough credit for oh. he's one of the funniest individuals that I've ever been able to kick it with. His wit is fucking on point, you know, and he's not NATO isn't a center of the room guy. He's not a beat his chest, make himself like the center of attention guy. Yeah. And and but and he's too humble i've always said that too he's too fucking humble like he needs to be more braggadocious because of his track record man it's like bro you're a fucking heavyweight you got to start dropping your dick platinum on these plaques ones. yeah yeah for some of his mixes dude and i mean people are coming to record from all over at least western canada i'm sure some people from outside of western canada come record with the guy but yeah you see a lot of different artists who are are in there working uh, it makes Shit, me proud the of Edmonton, I seen, you know. But. The latest I've seen was uh, Cryptic Wisdom out of the States now. NATO, he goes, sends all his shit to NATO to get mixed and mastered, for crying out loud. So, yeah, the word is spreading on NATO. Hell, yeah. Um, so with your new album there with the release party, I noticed you had, like, several different versions of the CDs. Uh, can you just explain the, the thought process behind doing the several different versions of the CDs? Tom, you can so, take that one. So, yeah, physical media is dead. Um, nobody cares about physical media. The only people that care about physical media are the collectors. Yeah. So with that in mind, we wanted to offer something interesting for the collectors, you know? So the people who sponsored our project, we turned around and hooked them up with, um, what was, we called the blue edition. So you couldn't buy that at all. You had to sponsor us ahead of time. You got a copy of that. Then we did the green, the 420 edition, and we made that a limited one of nine. And the, we did the red, a limited one of three, nothing different on the songs or anything, literally just for collectability of like, Hey, let's give the, let's give the fans who want the physical yeah. something to strive for. And we did, yo, we had a homegirl shouts out Becca who came through and she's like, I want every edition. Give me all the yeah. editions. I need them. So like, that was the idea is to get people who still support physical media and our collectors 
something to look forward to. Did you guys even put the call out for the blue ones? Because I felt like, like I talked to this dude uh, on IG, Collector Clout, uh, shouts to that guy, but he told me, that's that's why I know about the blue ones, because he told me he got a blue one, and I was like, blue one? They, they don't even have that color. But did you guys promote that, and I just missed it earlier down the line? Ish. So yeah. our original plan was to go for corporate sponsors, and we hit up, I think, over a 1,000 different companies with zero success. And then me and Pat looked at each other, and we're like, all right, let's put the same call out to the fans. And eight people stepped up. My homie, uh, Trav, Trap Travis, he stepped up with what we called the go, uh, the platinum. So he or the gold, he paid, uh, he dropped a G note on it. Damn. And then we had seven other people who dropped in at 250. So it was effectively doing, um, crowdfunding or a GoFundMe or whatever you want to call it, a Kickstarter, but we cut out the middleman. It was like, no, we're not going to give a cut to Kickstarter. You can just detransfer us. We got you, bud. Yeah. Nice. And man. Then, Shouts out to the other sponsors uh, uh, in the name of R. Woo, and then you got Wyatt, and then you got Luckless, and then you got Becca, and then you got who else? Come, am I missing anybody important? Yeah, Church, Church, Plex, Trap Plex. Travis, and Plex, Plex. yeah. Plex like, just got like Plex the MC Plex we're talking it. about. I know like, Plex. Like 118 legend. Yeah, 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 yeah. Doug, yeah. Doug from the duplex Plex or whatever. Doug from, <laughs> from the, the fucking duplex, duplex. Yeah, right. Plex. Right. Yo, that's right. Yeah. Yo, shout out Dubious for knowing Doug from the duplex. Yeah, I've been that's around DJ me. Dice too long to not Yo, know my Edmonton rap go. history a little bit, you know? Let's go. And, yeah, and what's cool about the different colors, I just want to say too, is like, the inspiration for the cover, we had done a few different things, but it was like we had always done colorful colors. And like I had done one with uh, my product of public schooling cover and then where it was all the different uh, cartoon characters. And then we did a very colorful one for Beverly Boys, too. And so I wanted to do something that was like Canadian nostalgic. So why not go with like the the Canadian school books that you'd have to use that everybody sees, you know? And so, and, uh, T laws, phantom tactics, because I got the, I got the Twitch chat here too. So I'm watching the yeah, chat nice. too, but phantom tactics, he was the guy who actually designed the cover as well and did all the artwork and did the artwork for the brothers, the new brothers, grim logo font and, uh, the minor that we have on the back of the merch too. Right on, man. It sounds like the entire team represented for you on that one. Um, Oh man. Yeah. Have you guys 100%. ever done vinyl? It got me thinking, though, like, do you think about so, pressing vinyl or so, yo, in 2024 yo, so, is vinyl done with? What, what's your opinion? So, no, no. So no. speaking of collector clout, this man was pretty much like a sleep paralysis demon over my bed every night. <laughs> Press a vinyl. Press a vinyl. <laughs> and then, yo, we really did. We did want to explore the option. The cheapest option I could find was a short order run of 100 at 30 a unit. And so in my, in my like honest opinion, I was like, I don't think it's a wise financial choice for us to sink $3,000 into a piece of physical media. Yeah. If I could have find a place that did 20 vinyl, I maybe would have considered it. Do you know what I'm saying? Dude, I've looked but at those I'm same numbers and thought the same things. It's that's a big hurdle to jump over. That's, that's a lot of people you got to be able to count on to pay you 50 bucks for for support you it know? would be different yeah. if we had like a a, a tour or, or a line of shows right. ran, ran up right so like it maybe you could move 100 vinyl over 20 shows across canada or something yeah right? once but, when people have just seen your show they're more likely to hand you some money for sure yeah mm -hmm. yeah um speaking of live shows i uh i wanted to ask you guys and i i ask a lot of different artists this but do you feel like you get more fulfillment from writing and creating the music or from actually being on stage performing it? Mm. Ooh. Do you want me to go first? Cause I, oh, yeah. Boy, I had, yeah, cause I got to think on that one. Both. So like, as I'm writing, I always feel like when someone's like, what's your favorite song? This new one that I'm writing and I'm not done yet in my phone. That's yeah. my favorite song. Cause I feel like it's my best song. Cause like, it's, it's like working out. You know, you, you're gaining muscle. And so, and like, I feel like there's certain people that are natural MCs. They're like that kid in school who was like in the fourth grade with a six pack already, just <laughs> fucking like shredded. They're good. They're naturals. And then there's the people who got to do it every day to keep consistent and keep sharp. Right. And I, I'm one of the people who has to put in the hours and the mastery work. Um, and so that's where I was like, I, I love the writing of it, but I guess 
it's that performance aspect that is even better because when we first, like we've been doing shows for 15 years now. And like the first times we would do shows, they were like smaller little pubs, everybody in their hoodies, you know, people grimy and drunk and shit. Now it's like nicer spots because you know, your, your bigger reputation crowds. precedes a nicer spot, bigger crowds. And it now becomes an event for people, you know? So like, you'll still have your grimy people and that's all good. But like, it now it's like, you know, the, there's people are dressing nice. It's the an beautiful event. People, people are there too. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it's a date. Yeah. It's a date for people. You know, a couple will come out, people will just come out and enjoy the show. And that's the awesomest thing because for me, it's like, I'm, I'm performing. I don't get to experience what they experience till I see the tags on the, on the phone videos and everything, and then watch all the other videos after that. And it's like, okay, now I get to attend my own show, you know, and see, right. So like, yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's both for me. For real, man. Yeah. I, I would say for me, it's like, I love writing and you know, I, I love, I think my pen is, I've always said, I think my pen's nice. People can come at me on a hundred different things. You can come at me on flow, on delivery, on anything, but nobody's going to come at me on my pen. My pen is filthy. And so like, I love writing, but the, the performance aspect of it is when the writing comes alive. And I always tell this story because it's like, I think it amplifies why I love performing so much. I wrote a line once um, and it goes Masons and tombs with a cask of Amontillado. Right. And it was on an old ass song called uh, The Darkness. Right. Wrote it like 15 years ago. And I, I would perform that song all the time. Da, 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 da. That's One on day I flaw. It's on. Yeah. Uh, no, it's on The Darkness, I believe. <laughs> no, it is on Fatal Flaw. You're right. I know because uh, I'm wrapping the bars in my head right now. Yeah, like, you no, want me to wrap through I your own to, bars? No, I had that. to finish the verse. I had to finish the verse. And when I hit the hook, I was like, oh, that is Fatal Flaw. Hey, yo. I was um, actually going to ask you guys if you memorize each other's bars like that, but you just answered that question without being asked. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, and I fed that line and we were at a hip hop versus hardcore show. And then some dude came up to me afterwards and he's like, bro, that fucking, uh, cask of Amontillado line, bro. That's my favorite Gothic poem, bro. Amazing bar. And I was like, holy fuck. Deep, deep, deep cut. Yeah. I wrote that bar for him. I'd never wrote that bar for anyone else except apparently for him. Cause no one else gets it. No one else thinks it's a dope bar, but this man got it. And we connected through that live performance and like the energy that you get from these people, when you, when you see them wrapping your words or feeling your words, it's just like, yeah, that to me is crack cocaine, man. It's, it's better than special. sex. It's better than drugs. Yeah. Huge. Yeah. Um, so like Pat, you mentioned kind of having a, a connection to hip hop where you felt like you were bringing people who maybe didn't respect the culture too much into it. Can, can we talk about kind of your guys's history, just how you got into hip hop in the first place? Like what, what brought you into the culture and got you connected with it? So, I mean, I'm born and raised in Beverly 118. Um, but as a child, my first ever hip hop song I ever heard was, uh, can I get a, and it was on rush hour and it was on the, and it was Jay-Z's verse on Can I Get a? But then as Damn, that was from the Rush Hour soundtrack. I remember that song yeah, from Rush like Hour, uh, a Rush Hour movie. I remember Can that I from a Jay Memphis ja Bleak Rule. album. I feel like there was a remix of it on a Memphis Bleak album with Missy or something. And uh yeah, yeah. But yeah, they they play it in the Rush Hour movie. And so like, and I was like, yo, what is this? This is crazy. But then when we were growing up, we were always like green shack kids. So we would just be going out all the time, fucking around and some of the first rap I remember hearing was this kid across the street and he had Napster and, but he also had like the Eminem album, the Dr. Dre album insane clown posse was huge at yeah. that time. This, so this would have been calm probably like, yeah, 96, 97, 98 to going over to Cody Prosco's house and uh, Josh and Tyler Maraboli's house and hearing those first rap songs. And it was like, yo, this is, this is awesome. And so like, then after that, like, going into junior high, I met this one kid, his name was Abdi, and he rapped, his name was A Squared, and he was out from Toronto, but he went to my junior high school, and so he was like, he he just wanted people to rap. He's like, like let's hear your bars, you know, and you'd type them out and stuff, and, and like, you'd rap them, and he got me to start rapping, and like, 
instantly I was like, okay, like I love this culture. And like, I, I just tried to do all the homework. Now you go back and you find all your favorite old yeah. artists and you just listen to shit. And like you study the game and, you know, and you try to sharpen your skills. And so like, from there, it was like, then me and Calm, Calm was writing his rhymes and stuff with his friends. And then we decided to like, just do a, do, do a group. And we recorded some of our first songs at uh, Tough House when he, they used to have a studio down on White Ave and Sonic used to work there. So you guys were writing raps separately of one another with separate crews in the first place? Not even crews, but like, yeah, just well, with, we're younger. Just, yeah, yeah, it's like, yeah, it was. It, what are we? A five year difference or a four year difference? Five four year, or five year. I think five school years, but like four years or something like that, yeah. or one of the others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. and yeah, like pretty much the yeah same story. Really, grew up always heard rap, always knew what it was. In um, you know, junior high is when I guess I really went down the rabbit hole, and for me as fucking crazy it is to admit it was Lincoln park and Mike Shinoda and also kid rock. Yeah. Because when I first heard kid rock, I heard American badass. And then I like looked up who kid rock was. And I was like, what the fuck? This guy used to look like this. And you go and listen to the old kid rock and you're like, Oh shit. He used yeah. to be what, yeah. like rapper. He used to be a real rapper and also Mike Shinoda in Lincoln park. And then from there it was like, okay, now I got to research everything, right? Yeah. Like, and it's like now after Eminem was obviously everybody's like, I listened to Eminem show. I could, I could probably recite that entire album front to back, starting with track one. I must've listened to that fucking album a million times. Yeah. Again. Zoran burned us a copy back in the day. I, I'm sure yes, between he, the three of us, we could probably just write down the lyrics for that. Yeah. That <laughs> Fucking out, and I and I'll die on the hill to say that that's Eminem's best album. I don't give a fuck. It is better than Marshall Mathers LP. I'll die on that hill. Right. But um, fucking, and then yeah, come high school, it was funny. In high school, I used to go by Fro, and I would write all my raps as Fro because I had a big ass afro in high school. I used to have pick out my hair because my hair was short and curly, and I would rock a big ass afro in high school. For Jack but, Harlow, <laughs> yeah, and bigger than Jack Harlow. And I had this one buddy named Landon and Landon, uh, I can't remember what his disability had, but he had a disability. So he was in a walker and me and Landon were actually like really good homies. We would hang out. He was a huge Oilers fan. I'd come to his house and kick it. We'd play video games and shit, but Landon was mad into rap too. And we would talk, we would listen to G unit records at his house, like all this shit yeah. when it, and Landon would write rhymes all the time. And then one day he's like, yo, I want you to rap my rhymes and so i remember recording on my basement usb mic a couple of his rap songs for him and playing it for me he's like oh this is amazing da 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 and then i was like yo fuck this like Probably i'm gonna write that. my yeah. i want to write my bars bro i fro started writing mad songs fro was <laughs> ready to go you know what i mean fro to and, go yeah and then me and pat at that this time we were both like yo i write raps i write raps and then we we're just like let's write raps together and then our mom yeah. named us <laughs> yeah I was, that's where i was gonna jump in yeah our mom named us brothers grim and uh and during that time yeah i remember that time too like obviously yeah it was eminem it was g unit it was dr dre and like on much music you'd watch rap city and stuff so like you'd see like swollen members you would see fucking the rascals you'd see Kip shop Rios. claire shop shop claire and mims and, Kip and, Rios and, and maybe classified Kip Rios. Yeah, yeah. Kip Rios. Kip Rios say something and projects wise misfit liar strangers friend those are two so, canadian slept on classics oh yeah yeah i was gonna say and rap metal was huge too so when you said kid rock i remember limp biscuit but yeah. like in limp biscuit their their best song was the urban assault vehicle and that was the first time i'd heard method man and red man yes, and me too. Like, no, yes. who are these guys you dude i had I mean? that that yeah, conversation man. about that song last week with jimmy burnett he told me the exact same thing that listening to method man on that link or on that uh limp biscuit album was like the first experience of hearing method yep. man and from there it was just hook line and sinker yeah. yeah, man. And and then but for me now, too, during that time, like I know Calm was really influenced by some of the guys in the South, too, when he was in high school. So I was in junior high, though. And like for me, it was like 
the dip set bomb went off. Boom, Cameron, Jim Jones, Joel Santana. And it was dip set that introduced me to Lil Wayne. And because Joel Santana and they, they did some, so many cross songs. But then once I'd heard Lil Wayne, like I'm 14 th- at this time listening to Lil Wayne. So I'm only 32 now, but or 31. I'm 32 in a couple of weeks. <laughs> but uh, um, that was that era for me, you know. So but then I would also go to these shows and, and now perform and shit. And like all the old heads would be like, I right, fuck Lil Wayne is killing rap. I hate Lil Wayne. And I'd be like quietly being like okay now trying to do my homework and shit but i'm like yo Lil wayne that was that was so influential for me yeah Lil wayne time. man he had like a really solid run between i don't know 05 and 2010 something like that i feel like wayne was oh, on man. fire it was tough to deny him at that point but yeah there were still people hating on him for using auto-tune here and there or whatever oh yeah 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 um, well, and uh, young Jeezy too, Jeezy and and Gucci Mane yeah. during during those times too. Like and this is before Gucci Mane was Gucci Mane, but he was just he was the guy with no shirt on in the Bart Simpson chain. Yeah, and and that this was also the era when YouTube was really good, so you could get Smack DVDs. And Papoose <laughs> was also my first famous rapper I ever met, and I was like fourteen years old when. Tough House brought him out to Edmonton. I couldn't go to the show, but I went down to uh, Juice Clothing in Millwood's Town Center, and I got to take a photo with him. <laughs> and I went with Calm too, and yeah, a few other people. Dope, man. Yeah, yeah uh, great. Give me great to like to, that. Oh, go ahead. I Calm, wanted man. to jump in real quick on my grade twelve years. I that think was the when mixtape era, rap really exploded for me because, like, I was already like going down the rabbit hole and doing all my research and like. For me, it's fucking, I was a nerd, so I found it, like, it was like a history project for me. Yeah. So I had, to, I did all the research. I was like, who are the first rappers? What was the first rap song? <laughs> you know, that's how I found out about all these dudes and shit. And then in grade 12, I was blessed enough to be able to go to New York. It was part of a school theater trip. But I went to New York, and I mean my love for hip hop exploded. Then I got to go to the Virgin mega store in times square. I've spent like $400 on CDs there. I got to go to Chinatown and I was buying mixtapes. I bought Papoose mixtapes, Saigon mixtapes, like, and I still have those to this day because I'm like, I'm never getting rid of those. Like, and it was just like, and then being in the birthplace, I was like, I was having a nerd orgasm. Like, yo, I'm in the birthplace of this fucking music. And like my love for it exploded then. And then as soon as we, I got out of high school, it was like, all right, let's take this serious. So we put out our first album, but Pat was still in high school too, which really helped, you know, push and propel us as well. Yeah. Weird. Um, can I ask you guys, you've both mentioned Beverly, of course, everybody who knows you guys knows you know, that you're from that area of Edmonton. Um, yeah, for people outside of Edmonton, can you can you describe Beverly um, a little bit? And I also wanted to ask, like, kind of rolled into one here. I see a lot of, there's a lot of popular Instagram accounts that kind of promote how, like, you know, Edmonton's gone to shit or whatever. And they, they want to show, like, you know, the the bad side of like people living on the streets or whatever, and like show people doing crazy shit um, and, and kind of complain about how like Edmonton has really went downhill. So I wanted to ask you guys as guys who have lived, I presume your entire lives in Beverly, ha- have you seen it get better or worse or like, what's it like now? Do you want me to go to first? Pat? You go first, Pat. Yeah. So I growing up, you you quickly realized it was like there was times when you're just trying to be a kid, but then like people want to fight you, people want to steal your shit, and and you you quickly realize like okay, a lot of people are roughing it around here. You're living at home. You're like okay, well you know my parents are doing all right, and thankfully like both my mom and my dad and you know our our mom and our dad always they stayed together so we were very grateful for that so we had both that male and female uh role model in the house and the representation of that in the house so like we were raised with good morals but you also you have to survive and like we we never joined any gangs or did anything like that but they existed there was crime out here they it existed there's 
But there's also a good lot of hardworking people. There's people every single day. I've, I've worked at plenty, almost every business in goddamn Beverly, you know, and like, it's it's a good place, you know, and so like, there is a good lot of hardworking people. I still, to this day, work in the community. And like, it's, it's like any struggling neighborhood with poverty, yeah. you know, but like, 2006 was like, a lot of crack around a lot of people selling crack, a lot of people smoking crack. Then it kind of died out. You had a lot of people get into like the pills, but then they banned Oxycontin yeah. and it kind of turned people into like, now out here you got the meth heads you got, you know, and it, it's unfortunate, but. It's good that you know that history, man. I used to work at a supervised consumption site down here in Lethbridge. It was the busiest one in the world or whatever. And a lot of people, I think, overlook that that happened. The whole, like, over-prescription of Oxycontin, getting everybody hooked on painkillers, and then they the made it illegal for two years and put it back on the shelves later, I think, with, like, yeah. a candy coating or whatever. But um, yeah. Oxycodone, yeah. It fucked yeah. up a lot of people, though, and they just turned to harder shit. Exactly, Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess if you, if your viewers don't know what I, the the what Beverly is or the history, the be I'll give a quick like two minute history library nerd lesson here. Like Edmonton was its own city. There was other small little towns around Edmonton. Beverly was one of those towns. Beverly was a coal mining town. We had a lot of coal mines around here. And then when the mine shut down, when they stopped using coal as such an abundant source, Beverly went broke. Beverly went broke to the point where when Beverly was finally swallowed up into the city and became part of the city of Edmonton in 1960, it was something like 70% of the Beverly residents were on social assistance. So Beverly has always been blue collar. It's always been low income. Then 70s come around, blah, blah, blah. Fast forward to the 80s. So now Beverly has only been a part of Edmonton for 20 years. And then boom, Abbotsfield is created and Rundle is created over the old Beverly dump that used to be a dump. And then they built a park over it. And then they also started to ram all the government housing into Beverly. 30% uh, of the government housing in the city of Edmonton exists in Abbotsfield. You know what I mean? So there is an overrepresentation of all this. The, 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 the things are concentrated into this area. Now, for me, as crazy as it was, because like Pat was speaking on, we had our mom and dad, we had a stable household. Like, you know, my dad had his demons and shit, but like they loved us. It never it never affected their parenting. It never affected their love of us. And like keeping a roof over our head, making yeah. sure we were always fed, making sure our clothes was always clean, shit like that. So despite living in this low income and, you know, poor area, I, I always joke, I had a completely sheltered life to what the realities were because it was normal to us. It was like, Oh, there's some drunk on the, Oh, whatever that person is, whatever. Like it wasn't. And it wasn't until I went to post-secondary when I went to Grant McEwen that I even realized about the stereotype because I would start telling people where I'm from and they would look at me like, Oh my God, you're what you live in Abbotsfield. What? Da, da, da. And that's when I was like, Oh, yo, I can lean into this. <laughs> like i can lean into this shit motherfucker think Beverly the whites yeah i can scare the whites <laughs> the whites are terrified of me you know what i mean and it's like i can really lean into this of, of being like yeah i'm from beverly i grew up here my whole life and i'm okay and i'm good and you're scared to even take the bus down here you little bitch like <laughs> And, yeah. and, I, and, and that's mm -hmm. coming from the guy who was the quote unquote little bitch in the neighborhood and was always fighting and getting beat up by bullies and shit like that. But still the next day coming back to school and to the same bully being like, fuck you, you bitch. Like I didn't give a <laughs> fuck, you know? So it's like leaned into it. And now you look at what we have fast forward now into 2024. Of course it's gotten worse, but that's not, that's systemic worldwide. We're in end stage capitalism. The system is falling apart. The yeah. U.S. dollar and fiat currency is bullshit. Okay, the <laughs> world is coming apart at the seams. So Facts. any major metropolis is getting worse. It's falling the fuck apart in every major city, yeah. not just in Beverly, and and it's going to get even worse unless something else fucking changes around here. 
because I agree completely yeah <laughs> western society has been living with the blinders on for a long time and the conditions we're about to face is how the third world has lived for the last 100 years so that we could have a thousand dollar iphones and ten dollar toasters all Great of that's job, about man. to yeah. come to a fucking crash Hell yeah. and 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 then and, and i guess being from beverly like me and pat have always joked oh well we got to go back to ramen that's what the fuck I grew up on. It's going to be the people who with the overextended six vacation properties and the three pickup trucks, and they're going to be the ones who blow out their brains when they got to eat mac and cheese for a month. Yes, or sir. they're going to try to come and take our ramen, and that's where we got to fucking, <laughs> hey, don't take our ramen. You know? That's, that's what they're going to get beverly out on if you try to touch my ramen. Hell yeah, man. Um. Okay, so guys, I have a friend who, when I told him that I was interviewing you guys tonight, he was like, oh, I love those guys' music. It's so close to what ICP does. And I was like, yeah, I mean, stylistically, sure, there's some similarities there. Um, but then it got me thinking more, and I was like, yo, but the whole, like, fan base is even more kind of parallel to, like, Juggalo World and what you guys had with, like, Bax War going on for a while. Can can you have you ever thought about that comparison? I think I saw you guys open for for ICP recently, right? Yeah. 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 So I will say this. I, sorry, I don't want to cut yeah, you off. No, I will say it. this. Like, I didn't understand anything about the Juggalo shit, and one of my good buddies was a Juggalo, and he convinced me to go to the gathering thirteen, number thirteen. This was eleven years ago, and the moment I went there, and the moment I experienced that culture. I now consider myself an honorary juggalo. I fucking love juggalos. I love everything to do with the subculture of juggalos. Battle Axe Warriors, at best, was a 5%, 10% merchandise grab version of what the juggalo culture is. And I don't want to disrespect the juggalo culture by comparing it to that. No, that's fair. I mean, making that comparison, like I was half expecting exactly that answer i mean before before we started this interview i was playing a couple tracks and one of them there was the deadly nedley track where you dude on that track you say some stuff about how like you don't want racist redneck fans and and like you know you, how you're not going on tour anymore because you no longer have a sponsor you you said some shit on that one if if people yeah. didn't hear that one they should they should definitely check out uh deadly nedley's album everything on there was dope but but that track especially was one of my favorites on there well, and, and i wanted to know you, like is that still how you feel three years out man like that was 2021 oh, when you oh, said that 100 percent, 100 percent. on the uh on the new album i have a song uh on the song highs and lows uh uh, uh, fucking, which is called Wow. Um, I say at, at shows my fans went ape shit. Turns out a quarter racist. Yeah. Um, and it's like, and for me, the biggest thing, if I'm going to be honest, it was during COVID, and then when uh, George Floyd and BLM hit, and seeing oh, yeah. the statuses of the right. majority, oh, man. Yeah. and seeing the statuses of these people who call themselves my fans, and who and who somehow were trying to say that. How the fuck, how dare you call yourself a fucking fan of either me or hip hop in general with these views of what's going on here. And that's what severely turned me off, oh, yeah. severely turned me off. And that's when I realized I thought I wore it on my chest, bro. My name is fucking comrade. I, Anybody like, who's paying out... attention, man. But a lot of those people <laughs> managed to miss the message. Yeah. Well, and, and, and here's why. And, and me and Pat have had this yeah. conversation too. It's like, Brothers Grimm shows weren't like, oh my God, common pattern, amazing lyricist, da da da. Brothers Grimm shows were, yo, let's all go to the bathroom. Oh, oh, motherfuck the world. Oh, oh motherfuck the world. It was just a giant drug fueled place for people to get <laughs> fucked up. Like, I don't, you can't call yourself a fan if you can't quote a single one of my bars and you only know the hooks to three of my songs. Yeah. Like, you're not a fan. You just came to my show to get fucking fucked up. Yeah. Like check yourself. Those you are the know same what I type mean? of people that'll talk while you play them your new song or whatever. Sit there 100%. and just like try to have a conversation to it. Yeah. Yeah, and man. and so I felt like after the BLM shit, I was like, oh, wow, I got to I got to triple down on this shit. I got to really every song. I got to beat them over the head with it and be like, yo, fuck you and call it out because it's my duty now. Because if I brought these fuckers in, I got to throw them out the house. If they're walking around on the furniture with their muddy Tims, it's up for me to toss them out of the house because I was the one who invited them in. 
right on man honestly i appreciate seeing it i i mean i've watched your guys's career uh, you know i i used to live in edmonton with y'all and like i've been to shows i've i've seen the scene and if i'm being 100 percent honest it weirded me out a little bit it was like close to like biker culture i don't know weird racism undertones with some of those guys you got to check tattoos with some of those guys you know uh and and 100%. so yeah like i said I, I i applaud you saying that shit and and taking it in this new uh direction and being very clear about it or whatever and even talking about it here man um you know thanks thanks for clarifying on that um 100 bro i'm yeah. transparent with it yeah weird um so can I ask, this is something I've been asking people, like when you look at, you know, tips for people who are trying to get their music to the world, the first one is always know your tar target audience. Do, do you guys have a target audience at this point? Because uh -huh. I feel like it's, it's, it's got to be, it, 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 it must feel like a bit of a weird place now putting music out after you've told a portion of your fan base to kick rocks kind of deal. So yeah, when they, when you say target audience, like, do you mean like as far as like an age group or as far as like a type of person? Or I mean, like... I think both of those things typically are rolled into it when I'm looking at like, you know, tips online for for artists or whatever. Like and I'm just talking about like scrolling threads or whatever. People are always giving advice. And like that's a big one is that you, you're supposed to know who your target audience is and then try to build up that thousand person fan base of that target yeah. audience. Right. Um, OK, so I guess then, yeah, to answer that question then like. From what I've seen, like looking, running the social media pages and looking at like the insights that I've seen, our target audience is, I think it's like 29 to 35 year old males at like 60%. Yeah. And then like 40% of them are like females. Yeah. Makes so sense. Same age group, 25 to, or 25 to 39 or something. Yeah. And, and it's and it's as far as sorry, as far as I go with the target audience, it's like if you would have asked me that five years ago, I would have had a perfect answer for you. And now my answer is I don't give a fuck. Yeah. Like you either like the songs when they come out and you absorb them and you can be part of my target audience now. Now you are my audience because you're listening to them. Yeah. Or you pass on them because you don't fuck with them and you're not my audience. But no, I'm not specifically writing for anybody in mind except myself. So, and yeah, not afraid to be polarizing, push, push people away who don't like it. There's plenty of people in the world, right? Um, dude, you also mentioned that you're no longer like, well, actually in that song on the Deadly Nedley album, you talk about how like you were told you'd get a record deal or something. And that, that made me want to ask like, would you sign a record deal at this point? Like regardless with who, just even in the concept of it. Cause I feel like a lot of artists are looking at the current music industry and being like, why would we ever want to be anything but independent at this stage? Well, well, so, so at least for me, it's like, well, what's the deal? I yeah. think to sit there and say, I would never sign a deal is ridiculous. Sure. If somebody came to me and said, Hey, I'll fund every studio session you ever, ever do any music video you ever do any cost associated with your music in exchange for 20% on the back end. Yeah. Done right now, sir. Let's shake my hand. Let's go. You know what I mean? What? So I'm not opposed to a deal that makes sense, but anything you're going to be offered nowadays probably won't make sense. Right. Yeah. I want a partnership ultimately. Like if somebody, whether they're an angel investor, they call them, or somebody who's like from the music industry, and even if it's like an independent, there's there's plenty of record labels in Canada, you know? Yeah. But like, I, I'd be interested if there is, but it, it, I, I'm looking for a partnership necessarily, like somebody who they believe in the music. And so would that and be it, more for like help with the promotional push or more for like help with booking and kind of the management end of it or like why because i feel like a lot of independent artists are like well fuck it we can just sell stuff direct to our fans right like what do well, we need at least for at least for us it's like we have done everything ourselves bro like when i did the tours promoter booker agent this that all these other things and it's like that's all good and dandy and i get that's where music is in 2024 it's good to have a i team. didn't yeah I, I didn't get into music to be a booking agent Right. I didn't get into music to be a fucking, you know, all these other things that you're supposed to have to do now to be into music. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, no, I got no fucking interest. And the other thing is money. 
it's like real shit. I know how to do 85% of the music industry shit myself. It's not like I'm stupid. I know how to do it, yeah. but it costs money. I can run ads, but it costs money. I can fucking, you know, direct videos, but all these things cost money. So it's right. like, if somebody can bring in capital or at least be like, yo, here's the capital, you know, me and Pat have always said, I'll, I'll bring on any grant writer that doesn't charge me. Take it off the back end if you're such a good fucking grant writer because A, you believe in Brothers Grimm and B, you're going to get paid because you're such a good grant writer. So it doesn't matter. Like, but you know what I mean? Yeah. It's the problem. Yeah. Sometimes with the grant system is that if you're not in the friend group, you're in the dead end group. Yeah. And it comes down to a jury of 12 and then another jury after that. And everybody's got to like you, right? But even when you want to put in the work to do it, sometimes, you know, you just don't make the cut of the team. And it is what it is. So I, I completely understand that. But I also feel like sometimes the grant system is like, it's like calling a lot of baskets back that are clear three-point swishes. And you're giving five points to a layup. And it makes no damn sense. A layup where no one was guarding the person. Yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately, it's just not the right call. We need to, it, the, the puck didn't cross the line. We need to call Ottawa here and go upstairs. And unfortunately, the puck didn't cross the line. And that's where it's like, that's why I'm not a fan of the grant system. And have you guys ever got them? I, I ask a lot of people, how important is getting grants? No, never got a zero grant. Yeah. Zero grants. Zero. And oh, I've applied for some, baby. but it is what it is. Funded, baby. I like, I, I, I will still keep applying for them, you know, but at the same time, the track record will also speak for itself. Like Book of Grimm, the Beverly Boys went like number 12 on iTunes. Book of Grimm, after not doing music for five years, went number two. Yeah. And, you know, so it's like, and and if, and I'm not even saying like, if we're talking pucks that cross the line, then like, they should be giving Kripal $50,000, $100,000. This man is that he's, he's, he's doing a lot of work. Going, yeah. He's got a hat trick out there on the ice, man. Like you got to throw the hats for the guy. So that's where it's like, it, but it just doesn't make sense like that, you know, but it, it doesn't do, they don't do that, you know, and there's other, and I'm not, not even in hip hop, but there's other bigger artists from Alberta, country musicians, and pop musicians, like they're scoring buckets too. They're scoring goals. They should also be getting funded, you know, and awarded. There, there's even certain like, you know, podcast slash radio shows that could use a little bit of backing from the That's Canadian I'm saying, government. Yeah. I'm out here promoting people harder too. than fucking CBC does. I'll tell you that. That's what I'm saying, man. So, yeah. so, so I look at it like I will keep doing what I need to do and I will always keep shooting my shot. But a lot of the guys that I've seen be successful in this game they've maybe received one or two grants in their career and they've backed it up just with hard work and their own marketing dollars. Word. And so I'll, I'll keep going. And maybe once I've already done a lot of stuff, they'll be like, man, we just, we can't keep calling goals back. We got to give these guys something, man, you know, and then I'll take it because I'll, and, and I'll be very humble with it. Like, but, and I'll keep applying and stuff, but. Hell yeah. Guys, can we shift gears? I know, like, you know, weed is big uh, in, you know, your guys' raps. Calm, I think the only time I ever shook your hand, we were, like, organizing some sort of weed rally or, like, 420 celebration or something. Anyway, Probably sitting on a board for Jay. it. Yeah, Probably. yeah. yeah. Um, I'm a bud tender. Yeah, right? You guys got the song, Bud Tenor. You got a couple songs on the new one that are pretty much dedicated to weed, really. Uh, some gelato references and whatnot. But I wanted to ask, like, do we like legalization? Are you because comma the the bars you referenced earlier about you know what happened when when I'll legalization you... came around? Um, yeah, yeah. I heard those earlier, uh, and and I thought to myself like, you know, but at the same time we were all out there fighting for legalization, weren't we? Like that, that that was what we fucking wanted, and yeah. I, I'll summarize it this way, man. My my pockets hate legalization, but my soul knowing that in the eyes of my son, I'm not a fucking criminal. 
knowing that I can walk around and fucking smoke a joint and not have some greasy fucking pig trying to ruin my life. And then I decide to swing on him and he shoots me or something like so over weed <laughs> over weed bro because back you know 15 years it's ago happened, on I'm a sure. yeah. the, you know what i'm saying like i don't know I, that's just where i'm like is is it is legalization good right now nah, bro it's so broken still like I, like i said until it's in a farmer's market and we're treating it like tomatoes it's still too much i but liked half legalization still- where you could still go into the dispensaries like if you had the legal medical card or whatever and like actually see the buds before you bought them and they'd have like you sure. know nice glass and we'll get there jars again. and all that bud we'll get I hope there so again uh, we'll get there again it just is gonna take a long fucking time but it's like Hey, the biggest thing is like, at least I can sit on a pound of weed in my house and I ain't going to be facing jail time. Life's great. Yeah. Word. Um, Indica or Sativa or PG, were you going to weigh in on that? I didn't mean to cut you off. I was going to weigh in on that because I feel the opposite way a little bit because I'm employed in the industry of legalization and it's been the longest job I've ever had ever. So it's good for your pocket. uh, Yeah. It's good for my pockets. And I love these infused pre-rolls. Them joints are crazy. Um, But the problem with the legalization, I'm trying to pick my right words to say because I don't know. I I would rather go off about rap, but this, like my job, I don't want to go off too much just in case something gets out and I get fired. Don't get yourself in trouble, yeah. Yeah, so... A lot of the legal companies are failing. And it's just because the beginning of legalization was very overvalued. And you have a lot of companies now who they are weed companies that pretty much their stuff doesn't get ordered by any of the other companies out there. So it sits at the AGLC. So those companies now have to go to then weed stores and corporations and do corporate deals so that those stores have to pretty much sell their shelf space to those products and those companies, because there's a lot of crony capitalism going on Mm, upstairs, you know? So it's just the name of the game. It's like any other industry. So I can't hate on it and it keeps me employed, but Rich hey. people are trying to ruin it like they will any other industry, right? They're going to come in there and take all they can, <laughs> line their pockets and not really worry about the product so much. Uh, yeah, you uh, know. Um, okay, so preference-wise, though, Indica or Sativa? Which do you guys smoke more of? Uh, I do smoke more Indicas. Like, my I, my favorite strain right now in the last, like, six months has been, like, the Runts. So, the yeah, the, the Gelatos are really nice um i also like uh hmm, i I like like a classic og kush you can never go wrong with um i do like some of these like infused pre-rolls they have i'm not a fan of the 510 carts or the legal edibles really uh yeah legal edibles man you'll get fat before you'll get high (laughs) yeah a lot of sugar in them they're expensive cookies and candies really yeah, well, There's and they're just weak, right? Like the, the the limits they set for for edibles is like so low that if you smoke on a regular mm-hmm. basis, you barely feel the shit. Yeah, yeah. Pre legalization, I would say any sort of heavy indica. Post legalization, my favorite is sir. What's your cheapest ounce today? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Whatever works. Word. Uh, and I assume I know the answer to this one, but do you guys smoke before performances? You like performance stone? I don't do anything not smoked. <laughs> yeah, like I, Fair. I've been cutting back a lot though. Like this last show that we did, I think I only smoked like yeah a couple joints before I performed, and I was I had a couple drinks, but um, yeah. Oh yeah, the Tiger's Blood. I seen Goose's comment there. I love those Tiger's Blood, the General Emission Tiger's Blood. I'll have to um, check that out. I don't know what that is. Oh. That's a strain, Tiger Blood. Yeah, it's, it's a three pack of infused joints. It tastes like blueberry, watermelon. They also have one one grammars out there too. Nice, nice. Uh, okay, so we're just over the hour point. Are you guys cool with hanging around for a few more minutes here? Uh, I normally ask people a series of how important is this or that. Uh, I'm fire them, bro. I'm ready. I'm cool. ready to rock. Fire right. them off. How important is a good stage show? Very. Very. Do you guys rehearse before stage shows? I do. <laughs> 
<laughs> so for yo, so for the first time ever in my life, Pat dragged me to two rehearsals. And I honestly, I like rehearsing on stage as I know that sounds crazy, but I like doing a lot of shows and getting shit down on stage because I find one on stage is when shit comes to me. Yeah. Oh, I want to do this now. I like it this way. Oh, I, I'm going to need backup here and there. But yeah, we did do two rehearsals for this show, which for me was a first ever. But no, normally I don't. Re- my my idea of rehearsing is sitting down and, you know, fucking rapping my song. And do I have my song? Memorized? So you kind of rehearse by yourself done more so than yeah. actually in the same yeah. school with each other. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, how important is it to have a DJ or a hype man on stage? And when I'm talking to two guys who rap together, this one's always interesting about the hype man. Uh, DJ very, hype man not very. Yeah. yeah, I would say about the same DJ DJ is important. It, the only way you can avoid a DJ is if you tailor create everything like and basically work with your engineer beforehand to like, OK, I'm going to take all 11 of your songs, mix them together with the 45. You know what I mean? But a DJ is what brings that all together live and makes it fun. Hype right. man is hype man's oh, nice to have, but it's not a, necess- a, a necessity. Yeah, if for, you're a solid enough solo performer, you may not need one. But if you're if you kind of need those air breaths or whatever, it's not bad to have one. Yeah, uh, I mean, I've talked to other guys who are like in groups with another MC, like you guys are, and I th- I think that might be the ideal situation because then you have somebody who's actually like really dedicated to knowing your bars as well and like really has the right energy and whatever. I think yeah, hype men can be hit or miss, but. Um, this one's interesting for you guys, especially uh, how important is it opening big name when big name artists come through town? It depends how you play it. So seven out of 10, seven out of 10 it, overall. If it fits your style of music that you are kind yeah. of making and it's your lane of music. And when you kind of bring it back to your target audience, yeah. if you have similar fan bases that you know your fans like that type of person's music too, it makes sense to maybe try to get on that show because yeah. when you're up there for that 10 minutes, you're up there, you do your three most banging songs and you'd be like, hey, you go follow me on Instagram, Spotify, Google, YouTube, fucking everything. And then when you get out down there, you go and you mingle in the crowd, you go hit the smoke pit, you talk to the people. You pick, you grab their phone out of their hand and you say, hey, da da da. Okay, I'm just gonna follow myself on Spotify. Follow da da da. Here, there you go. Beautiful. Yeah. You know, yeah. you you market that. You you get that. You know, and and I I so, but if you know, like let's say Rick Ross comes to town and Brothers Grimm are opening up, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. 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 And and for me, um, uh, like like since Rick Ross. Pat, touched, Pat touched on the lanes of it. I would say it, you have to have it make sense to a a financial degree. And so what I mean by that is I see now the commonality is these dudes have to pre buy tickets and then it's on them to either sell these tickets or give them a way to recoup their money. And we never went that far. That to me is wild. Now, did we hustle tickets for opening acts and got a cut for it? Yes. But to be fair, when you're opening for a guy like Tech Nine and you're getting five dollars a ticket and you have unlimited tickets to sell, that's some good payday to yeah. just run around the city yep. and sell tickets. And like those shows where we were able to sell tickets and get a cut off of were not only good paydays, but also put us in front of a thousand fucking new fans or oh, really? potential, I should say, new fans. And those yeah, are so his fans are people who really love to support indie rap too, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, how important is an MC's fashion? Nowadays, I think important. Yeah, it, it um, is important, but I fucking hate the fact that it is important. I, I would say be comfortable with yourself, and your confidence will become your fashion. Yeah, I like that. Um, how important is an MC's political leaning? This one's a bit of a curveball. Hot seat. Well, not important. No. Very important. <laughs> you guys completely opposite directions with that one. Okay. All right. Um, how important is listening to legends of hip hop? I think it's good to study the game and you can see the younger kids now who are like 16 to 18 who have studied the game versus the ones who haven't. Right. 
Me- medium important. I'm, I, I would never expect an 18 year old to go back and listen to cool G rap or big daddy Kane or any of those dudes. But can you go a little bit back? Can you go I mean, listen to big L? But, but yeah, listen, right. Yeah. You know what I mean? But like, hold th- up though. How come it wasn't ridiculous for any of us three when we were 14 year old guys in Edmonton God, who actually whoa. had to go to HMV and buy CDs to, to do that history, right? Like we're old. I don't now mind, you can just I, fucking I, I, open up Spotify and listen to whatever you like, bro. Like, <laughs> because it's it's a historical thing, and so the reason why I say we're old and da 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 is there's 20 more years of history they have to do now. So as long as those kids can go back one generation, like okay, if you're 18 now, go back 20 years is yeah. 50 cents. Get rich or die trying. Can For you go real. back at least that far now? I'm not even asking you to go back to fucking Big L anymore. I'm saying go back to 50 for fuck's sakes. <laughs> so, Figure out who he was before he was an actor. Yeah. But here's what's crazy too is that we also, that same era, I think why we wanted to do the homework because you also got called whack if you were whack. You know, so you didn't want to be whack. And that that meant more than like that meant like you were yep. you were everything. You were poor. You were weak. You were everything. You were whack. No, yeah. I don't want to be whack. So I got to do my homework. And so yeah. like nowadays, though, it's different. Like kids call each other whack. They want to fight each other. It's on site. And it's just like, yo, there's something wrong here. Like keep it to the rhymes and then the diss tracks are cool but when the diss tracks spill out into crazy shit it's like what's going on you know like yeah yeah nobody needs to get violent over rap lyrics in my opinion you know it's (laughs) it ain't that serious right but i guess sometimes it is but it depends who you ask um it's it's a sad thing yeah for for real uh Okay, so kind of just to wrap things up here, I ask everybody, can you guys describe your local scene? Describe the Edmonton hip-hop scene. Who wants to go first on that one? (laughs) There's a lot of good artists. There's a lot of whack artists who should stop rapping and put it down. All right. That's that's that. Yo, I was going to go off, but uh, I would say 25% dope, 75% whack. I think a lot of these guys could eat of a state fans or pick up a camera and start shooting photography or learn how to, or learn how to do graphic design for rappers or learn how to build websites for rappers or learn how to sew clothes and make custom clothing for rappers. There's a lot of different lanes that this scene needs. It does not need more rappers. And, and I especially say this, and I mean this wholeheartedly from the bottom of my heart, but Lord, if you are 35 and starting to rap, stop now. Like, mm-hmm. stop now. I don't got any hate in my heart for somebody who is grinding out. You know what I mean? But like, I, I it, it, it kills me when I see these guys who are 37, 38, 39, 40. My debut album. The fuck are you talking about? <laughs> so do you think this is something I ask people too? Is, is hip hop a young man's game? Uh it doesn't, I think, no, it I think doesn't ageism has started to die off in hip hop because some of these legends are still out there making music that's dope in their 50s, right? Legends, legends. Yeah. That's your thing. Because you know why we're okay with it is because it's dope. But when Pete and Bass do it, even though their flows are dope and it's like, yo, this is dope music, we're still laughing because it's two geriatric fucks who obviously have ghostwriters despite the music slapping. You know what I mean? And so there's hip hop hasn't got to the point. It's not quite rock and roll yet. It'll eventually get there where at any age, anybody can pick it up. And as long as they're good, we'll fucking rock with it. Right. But there is still like old people are welcome if they got old into hip hop. But no, they're not welcome in. Well, and the other thing come to me is like a lot of guys talk like you talk now about how you don't give a fuck about promoting it. You're just putting music out into the world. If it does well, if people like it, good if it doesn't fuck it i made the music it's there i i think that's the way a lot of these old dudes who are just starting now are doing it they're just they're just doing it because they want to do it and it costs 15 bucks to put a song on spotify right it's not really that serious i agree but i guess what i have to do a better job then is why the fuck are these guys even coming up in my feeds like why am i why do i even know they exist then fair like i i thought i thought gary's a plumber and all of a sudden gary's a rapper now what the (laughs) fuck gary hang it up gary word um can you guys name artists uh 
from Edmonton who people should be up on? Who's who's the dope twenty five percent? Oh, Pat, you go Crying first, and then I'll give mine. Okay, so Crankwell, uh, I'll name Arden, any book. but I don't know if Arden's even in Edmonton anymore. Um, Arden, is that what he raps by? Who's who's Arden? Why do I not know Arden? Uh, he he got signed by uh, Isaiah Rashad. I'm pretty sure he went on tour with all those guys, and he's blowing up right now. Okay, um, I'll tap in. I really like uh, uh, Ricky Paolo. He's really good too. Uh, Richie Paulo, I think his name is. Yeah, Richie Paulo. He's got this record called uh, Fool. He's got this record called Roads. He's got this record called On the Run. He's really dope. Um, I do like uh, DZ the Dawn. I like DBX. Um, I like Kelly Trap Phones. He's a really dope young artist coming up. I like JC. He's a dope artist coming up. Techie. Uh, this kid named B Dot's dope. Um, who else is dope? Touch is just... Touch is the best. Touch yeah. is the best. Um, who this else? is why I Got asked it? this question so that I can find more people for me to play on Atsic. You've named a bunch of names that I didn't recognize, so yeah, I'll I'll tap okay. in. Yeah, man. I was Touch gonna say, yeah, though. I don't know, Pat. Pat pretty much touched on them all. I'm trying to think. Uh, I guess the one dude that I, I I'll be honest, the one dude I've spun the most from Edmonton in this last year is uh JC three, two baby. And his, uh, his little EP, he put out general Bishop. I've, I've spun that EP <laughs> a rank amount of times now, which is crazy. It's my walk home music from the mall, man. I fucking love it when I fuck it. And, and yeah, Right on. There's there's other dudes like and I'll be honest, there's dudes I'm out of touch in the sense of like there's dudes who all of a sudden I'll go to the Edmonton hip hop scene group and I'll click and I'll be like, oh, this guy's dope. I've never heard of him before. So I am finding dope dudes every day. But for every one I click that I'm like, oh, this guy's dope. There's five clicks that I'm like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> uh, TK Cabral is really dope. Yeah. Who else is uh, who else is out here killing it? I'm trying to think. I always like not to sound selfish, but like I always it's not that I'm blocking other people out, but like I'm trying to think of when I wasn't making music, when I'm making music now, like if they're not like right in the in camp, like if it's not like Kripal or Sonic or something, like they don't really show up on my news feed. You yeah. know what I mean? Like I don't I'm trying to think of who else that I seen that was really good. Um and then I mean, he like, I like listed so one, bro. You listed Kaz like Megas, 30. Yeah, Kaz Mega's dope. Uh, Kaz Mega's dope. Talking to Kaz Mega is. next week. If you guys are bored, tune in next week. I'm talking to Kaz for another one of these. Oh, Kaz is the best. Yeah. yeah. Kaz is dope. Um, who else? Uh, there's a female <laughs> artist, same as me, music. He's good. I'm going to let you keep going until you, until you say you're done, man. I'm just going to sit here and let you think if you want. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I said Sonic. Oh, Trips. Trips is one of the best, too. Trips is dope, yeah. Uh, my homie Deezwax just told me Trips was recording with him a couple weeks back, so there should be new music coming from Trips. Um, oh, but... I forgot one. Mr. Rotisserie. Rotisserie, you the shit. I'm too legit for you clueless kids. I'm smooth like Orange Julius. Okay. Gotta, Halo. Use, gotta use the lift. You should check out Taylo. Taylo is oh, really Taylo. good. Taylo. Taylo. There's another. Taylo is arguably Edmonton's most slept on musical talent, bro. I fucking love Taylo. You guys came up with a lot of names for two guys who have given me, like, arguably the most negative take on the what's the Edmonton hip hop scene. <laughs> like, you're like, fuck the Edmonton hip hop scene, except oh, this, guy, this guy, this guy, here's this guy, this guy. We named 25%. That may, have been, that, that like, may have been, yeah, I was about yeah. to say, that may have been 50 names, bro, but that True. means there's 200 whack people in this city, my Which friend. Is Probably about right. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's true. There, there's no gatekeeping anymore, right? So anybody who wants to can put their right. music out there to the world. So yeah. Comics is dope too. Yeah. Comics. Comics MC. All right. Uh, Shit, I got my homework to do after this one, man. I'm gonna be going through. Yeah, names. I'm trying to name off names so you can check them this out. Is after. The Pack Rim hit list, bro. You're gonna have a whole fucking show <laughs> just spinning Pack yeah. Rim recommendations oh, here. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I think that's it for, okay. for right now. If any Fair. else come up to me, I'll just blurt them out. Fair enough, yeah. man. Um, <laughs> well, we're pretty much wrapping it up here. So do you guys okay. have any, any anything to promote, any shows or tour or anything else coming up that we can tell people about? 
Hey, um, I'm just going to be working on <laughs> nope. some new music. Uh, hit us up for some merch. Uh, I got some new music on the way. Comrades got an EP later on this year. We'll probably put out a few more videos from Book of Grimm. Um, follow us on our Instagrams and our Facebooks. I'm Pat Beverly Grimm. He's Brothers Grimm. Hell yes. Futuresgrim.com. Go to the social media, futuresgrim.com. That directs you to everything else that we have. So again, that's futuresgrim.com. You got to say it three times to make it stick into people's minds. Yeah. Yep. And uh, that's uh, yeah. I don't know. I don't. I, again, I'm I'm having fun now, bro. I'm having I'm having yeah. more fun with music right now than I've had in a long fucking time. So I just want to keep having fun with it and and enjoying the ride. As far as a way to support an artist in 2024, uh, what's what's the best method? Should people be buying merch? Buying merch. Yeah. yeah, buying merch. And then the yeah. second is seeing us live. And then the third, if you can't do either of that, is playing us on Spotify 24-7 so we can make 11 cents. That'd be sick. <laughs> Run it up. Yeah. The Bird. best way would be paying for merch in Satoshis. So I do accept Satoshis for, for <laughs> merchandise. You know, if you, if you have any BTC, I do accept that as well. That'd be the best way. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> I'll take Satoshi's. <laughs> so that's a good investment to trade music for uh, Bitcoin right now, I think. Um, yeah. You. All right, guys. Well, um, this has been dope. I enjoyed talking to both of you. Uh, it, was, it was nice to, to meet you and, and get to kind of chop it up a little bit. Um, but yeah, that, that's all for tonight. Appreciate it. Appreciate wow. you, man. Thank you for yeah, having man. us. Man. This is a great time. Hell yeah. Much love. Much take love. it easy, guys. Peace. All right, everybody. Thanks for coming through. Uh, if you don't know, make sure you go check out After the Smoke is Clear at Sick Radio. Uh, that's the hour-long mix show that me and my homie DJ Dice do every week. I listen to like eight or nine hours of independent hip-hop every week, new releases. We never play anything twice, so like I just pick my favorites from you know, all the new releases that come out every week. It gets a little bit overwhelming sometimes. Um, you know, so I whittle it down to just the stuff I like most and end up with like 20 or 30 songs a week. Those go over to Dice. He mixes them with his, you know, 30 plus years of hip hop DJing experience. The guy is a wizard with turntables. And um, the result goes to Mixcloud.com slash dubious. We'll have a new episode up on Thursday um, and as well here on Twitch. Uh, hit follow if you like this type of content. Um, a lot of what I'm doing here is either, you know, working on my own music. I, I got a camera in my uh, mic booth and I write my own stuff and record my own stuff. Um, as well as, you know, I'm here putting together After the Smoke is Clear. Uh, I'm here doing interviews every Tuesday for Fly in Formation. So uh, coming up next week, like I said, March 12th, I'm talking to Kaz Mega. March 19th, I'm talking to Hollahan, the legendary KOTD rapper. Looking forward to that. March 26th, I'm talking to Fresh Kills. Uh, and then I'm booked all the way through April and May. So a lot of exciting names coming up. Um, make sure you check my social media. It's uh, at dubious with an underscore after it, but also dubious.com is where you can find everything that I do. That's the hub. Uh, I make little blog posts about everything that i'm doing too over there so check the post section on dubious.com uh, i appreciate y'all coming by and thanks a ton for all the new follows and subs and whatnot tonight this has been dope i had a lot of fun but uh calling it a night for tonight have a good one everybody